This title I've got on the screen here um, actually took quite a lot of thought. A lot of thought went into this title. And the way I want you to look at this title is, is like this. The Bible, it's time to change your mind. And the word change is extremely important in this talk um, that we're going to go through. And by the way, I'm going to sort of get you involved slightly in this talk. That's what I've decided to try and do. People have said you won't be able to get people involved here. They won't talk back. So it's all going to be over very quickly. <laughs> okay, so um, what I want you to do just to start with, to think about this word change, what is the word for something that changes from one creature? Yes, metamorphosis. I didn't even finish the question, and the answer is there. So the question was, what is the, the word for one creature turning into another completely different creature? And the answer that came out, before I even finished that, is metamorphosis. So, what is the dictionary definition, would you say, of metamorphosis? To change from one form to another. To change from one form to another. I would say that is right. I know that's pretty right because I checked it before it came out. And the answer is a complete change of physical form or substance. So when we, metamorphosis is changing completely from one thing into another. But surprisingly, there is another definition within uh, the dictionary which says this. A complete change of character or appearance. So it's not just about physical change metamorphosis. It can also apply to mental change as well. So your character changing can be described as metamorphosis. So just keep that in your mind if you can. Now, somebody tell me any creatures that you can think of that go through the process of metamorphosis. Tadpole to a frog. So we've got tadpole to a frog. I'll take that one. Any others? Caterpillar, Caterpillar into butterfly. butterfly. Yeah, any others? Nymph into dragonfly. Nymph into dragonfly. Any others? Must be no. A leg into a chicken. <laughs> you could say. Now that's different. That is different because the, the egg is still embryonic. The, the, the critical bit when it comes to metamorphosis is that it, take the caterpillar, you've got something that's living and breathing, got eyes, got a mouth, it's wandering along on its little uh, legs, it's eating, it's having a great time as a caterpillar. And yet it completely and utterly transforms itself into something else. And so I would say, when you look at it, the, 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 the big ones here are the tadpole that turns into a frog and the caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. And those are the two biggies, I think, when, when you look at it. In fact, though, the, the most amazing one of them all, I think is the caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And the reason that it is just so amazing and so different and so spectacular and so miraculous <coughs> is that if you watch... You see that tadpole? Has anybody ever had frog spawn and, and watched yeah. the process yeah. and you've seen it happen? And literally, you can watch it. When you come down in the morning, if it's on the, on the shelf, you can... I mean, it sounds a bit horrible having a tadpole on your shelf, but some of you will have done that. And you come down... And then, lo and behold, you see some little legs, and you see, and you see it literally changing before your eyes, don't you? And the body of this creature physically changes bit by bit. Not the, not the caterpillar. No, no, no. No, no, no. The caterpillar is unique out of all creation in what it does. What the caterpillar does is when it goes into that cocoon completely and utterly dissolves. It becomes a genetic soup of nothing. There is absolutely not a single element of that caterpillar that's recognisable. It completely melts. It deconstructs. There is nothing there but a soup. And do you know something amazing? This thing then rebuilds itself into the shape of a butterfly 
But genetically, the two, you know when you look at DNA inside something? It is the same creature. So when you look at the DNA of the two, they are identical. It's the same thing, but it's like you melting down, becoming nothing, and then rebuilding yourself into something. Hey, look, I've got wings. This is great. It's the most astounding out of all metamorphosis. And you'll see why this is an amazing example and why we're talking about it in just a minute. Why am I talking about metamorphosis? Well, I don't, did anybody see this on the TV? This was on TV about three weeks ago. Metamorphosis, the science of change. It was on BBC. Anybody? You're all watching Sky Sport or you're watching something. I don't know what you're watching. But it was on TV three weeks ago on the BBC. And when this thing was on, we haven't actually got a TV. I watched it on iPlayer. And I was just taken with this thing. And I'm going to play you the first three minutes of the intro to this. Imagine you woke one day to find yourself living in the body of a creature completely different to what you used to be. Your shape, your body parts, your individual cells, rearranged by some unknown force into something new. You have been transformed. This is what happens to countless creatures. It is called metamorphosis. It is how the tadpole is changed into a frog. How the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It is one of nature's most powerful phenomena. And to me, one of nature's most mysterious. Metamorphosis is such a spectacular odd kind of change. A creature stops itself in its tracks, seems to tear itself apart, and then rebuilds itself as a completely different kind of creature. I don't think you can help but be intrigued by that. And so it went on. And it was a fascinating thing. And I was programmed all about it. We, we could just play that and I could sit down, but we're not because you might be sat there thinking, what has that got to do? What's all this metamorphosis about? In terms of the Bible, this is a sort of a Bible talk, I presume. Well, it is. And here is what we're going to look at. I wonder if you'd have a look with me at Romans chapter 12, because the word metamorphosis is in the Bible. And here it is in Romans chapter 12. And what I want you to do is when I read this verse, it's just one verse we're going to look at. I want you to spot the word, if you would that you think is the word metamorphosis. So, in verse 2 it says, uh, Romans 12, verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, when this was written, it was written in the Greek. A metamorphosis is a Greek word. And so buried in this verse is the word metamorphosis, which is the word? Transformed. It's the word transformed. So if you were reading this in the original, you would have read the word metamorphosis, not the word transformed. So whoever translated it thought, well, I'll put the word in as transformed because people might understand that more than we understand metamorphosis. But that is the word. So the question is, ladies and gents, what is it, according to this, that we've got to go through this process of metamorphosis? What is it? Sorry. What does the verse say we've got to change? Mind. Our mind. Our mind has got to go through the process of metamorphosis. That is what it says. Now, for those of you who are into linguistics and language, let me just explain something here. Uh, metamorphosis is a verb, okay? And this is written in a particular tense. It's written in the imperative. Does anyone, if I said this is imperative, what would that mean to you? What does the word imperative mean? Demand. It's a command, it's a demand, it's, it's a submergency to it, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. If I say it's imperative, we get out this building, how fast would you get out? You'd, you'd make a run for it if I, if I came across and said it's imperative. This is an imperative verb. 
in the Greek. It means it has to be done. It, there's a sense of urgency to it. You've got to get on with it. And it also applies to you as an individual. That's how this is written. So it isn't saying, uh, uh, transform your mind. It's saying, transform metamorphosis your brain, your mind. That is exactly what it is saying. And the reason that we've got to go through this mental process is to find out what it is that God wants us to do. Can you see that there? That you may prove what is good and acceptable, not to your dad, not to your mom, not to me, not to anybody in here, but to God. So it's a big deal to get this right. A really, really big deal. Now, what I want you to uh, have a little think about here is um, apparently there are one million species of creature out there. Now they debate it. Some say there's a few more, a few less. But let's just, as round numbers, say there's a million species. And there's us as part of the one million species. Would you all agree we're part of the, the, the species on the planet? Yeah. I think we would. We're all there. Now, what I want you to think about, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this, do this and you must do it in silence. I want you to think about what it is that makes a human being different than all of the species. So we've got all species. We've just agreed we're part of it. But there's, don't put your hand up and don't answer, right? Because you've got to think about this, and I'm going to give you time to think about it. So what I want you to do is to think about what makes us different than all of the species. And I'm giving you 30 <coughs> seconds to not utter a word, but to think about it. Here we go. Answers, please. What is it that makes a human being? Yes? There's an answer. That's right. We've got intellect. Any other answers? What was Conscience. We can smile. We can process thought. Accountability to God. Accountability to God. The ability to reason. We can choose. Yeah? Denise? We can we conceptualize. Any other words? All of those things, pretty much all of them, I'd agree with. The big one, the clue, right, was in the question. Because I said to you, yeah. I want you to think about this question. And all of you hopefully had thoughts in your mind. And that in itself was unique. There is no animal on the planet that sits down and thinks thinks, not one. They don't actually sit and think anything. They think nothing. A small child, a very small child, starts to think. So from a very young age, you can teach a child about God, can't you? You can, it's possible. And by a very, very young age, they've actually got a concept of God, of stories, of things that are happening. They are already starting to think things. Once they get language coming in, they can start thinking from a very... You can get all the monkeys in the world yeah. and take them from a very young age and talk all you like about the Bible and about God. They won't have a clue what you're going on about. They do not think. Yes, they have emotion. They, 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 they have uh, a sense of joy. They can have a sense of fear. They can have a sense of some degree of happiness. They can feel content. They can feel hungry. They can feel pain. They can feel all these th things. We can train them to do But I'm telling you now, no dog, however intelligent it might look, sits there and thinks to itself, it's raining outside. It will see that it's raining outside, and its instinct says, I don't want to go out, but it doesn't think. Not one thought passes it through its head, not one. No creature on earth thinks. So all those things that you said were all true. 
And here is a list of the things that make your brain unique out of all creatures on the planet. We can therefore reason. We can understand. We have a complex language. Some might say, well, an anim- you know, the dog barks. A wolf means a certain thing to another dog. But it's not l- complex language. It's not to do with language. They cannot read. You can give a, any animal on the planet a book. And none of them would read. It doesn't matter how long you spend with any animal on the planet, you'll never, ever get them to read. They'll never, ever think. There is no language. There are no thoughts in an animal. So what God, you see, is saying to us in Romans chapter 12 is quite simply this. We have to transform and metamorphosize the one thing that sets you apart from everything else he made. Everything else that he made. That's it. So, we, we've just considered in creation what goes through the process of metamorphosis. And I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to prove to you, that your brain has to go through the identical process of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And out of all the creation, and all the things that go through this process of metamorphosis, this is the one that your brain must go through. It is unique, as I've already explained to you, out of all creation in the way that it changes, and it is identical to what has to happen in your brain. And that is what we're going to look at. I'm going to play you another video, hopefully it works, just to give you some idea. I know we know what it goes through, but this was... Lo and behold, another program, totally different, all about butterflies at the very time. They must have a thing about butterflies at the minute with the BBC.
Interesting, isn't it, when you look at that? And God is saying that your brain has to go through exactly the same process. Exactly the same process. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? And I want you to look up some passages. You'll see what we're going to do. We're going to break down the stages of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly and compare it to our brain. Okay? You with me on this? So the stages of the caterpillar are quite simply this. It starts off as a caterpillar. And tell me, what is it doing full-time? It's eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and growing and eating and eating. And once that bit's over, it then attaches itself firmly onto a branch. And I don't know if you know this, but the, you know it's, it forms like a chrysalis. That chrysalis is its own skin. It, is not like, it hasn't built something outside itself. Its own skin forms the chrysalis itself. And inside that chrysalis, it melts down to nothing. It becomes a soup, as they call it on the program. It's just a soup. If you opened it up, you think, what's that? It's just nothing. It's just liquid. <coughs> so the caterpillar dissolves into nothing, and then it completely reconstructs every part of itself again into the most wonderful creature that now comes forth and starts... We saw the transformation. We see it every day. Every single country in the world has butterflies. There isn't one that doesn't. Not one nation on Earth hasn't got this creature. And so there's an example everywhere of these things. So, what, what I want you to do is uh, imagine that your mind is a caterpillar. And you've got to get your brain from a caterpillar into a butterfly. That's what the game is. Why? Because God says, I want you to do it. It's imperative that you get your brain to metamorphosize into a butterfly. That's exactly what it said in Romans 12, verse 2. And it's imperative. So the question is, and this is the first question, the caterpillar is an eating machine. What must your mind be eating every day? I want you to either work with the person sat next to you or on your own if you're a little bit of a loner. I don't mind. Or get in a little group if you want to. But there's three passages I want you to look up. They're on the screen. And, and you've got two minutes, probably three maximum, to look at those passages. And I will ask you, in two or three minutes, what is it that this caterpillar, your brain, should be eating? Off you go. First passage is Luke 4, verse 4. Then 1 Peter 2, verse 2. And then Job 23, verse 12. Have you all looked at those passages yet? Any, anybody still outstanding? Okay. So if your mind is like this caterpillar, and this caterpillar is eating, 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 what is it that your brain should be eating? The Word of God. Would everybody agree with that? We should be eating the Word of God. So... Um, the verse I really like is this. I mean, all of them are saying that type of thing. And there's lots of verses in the Bible that talk about this. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, says Job, talking about the words of God in Job 23, verse 12. He says, it's actually more to me than my food. My shred is in the morning, my cornflakes, my meal at night is nothing to me compared to the words of God which are my food. So when you then now see that caterpillar, and you saw the speed it was eating, and chobbling through tons of stuff. In fact, here's another question. What is it that the caterpillar is eating? All it eats are leaves. You could give it a load of fruit, it would walk straight by the fruits. It would walk straight past the banana, it doesn't care for that. All a caterpillar eats are leaves. Now, somebody tell me, what are leaves full of? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. What is chlorophyll actually doing? It's converting sunlight into energy. It's grabbing light and absorbing the light and then converting the light into energy. So a leaf is full of light. In effect, isn't it? It's taken the light. What is the Bible? Is there any links to the Bible and it being full of light? Spiritual light. It's full of God's light, spiritual light. It's full of a, 
imagine the world's a dark place and the Bible's like a torch that's shining around and it guides you through all the twists and turns and without it you haven't got a clue where you are, what you're doing. It's full of God's light. God has thrown into the Bible his light which is his wisdom, his understanding. So Mr. Caterpillar that's eating away like crazy is eating light. Forget about the fruit, that might taste nice, but it's getting you nowhere. It's eating boring old green leaves. This book looks nothing special, it's full of light. And that is what he is eating. And we, I want you to keep in your mind that image of the caterpillar and how much he is eating. And say to yourself, is my brain, how much have I eaten in the last week of this book? Because actually, if all you've had is, is, is one nibble of a tiny bit of green leaf, don't expect to go through the transformation. Because do you know something? You'll die. The caterpillar has to keep eating. It can't transform itself unless it builds me enough calories. It goes through five changes of skin, and on the fifth time, and everyone does, on the fifth time, it's the chrysalis, and off it goes and changes. But if you don't feed it enough, it won't go through the change. So it all has to start with eating. Everybody happy with that? You might not be. You might say, I haven't got time to read. I'm too busy on my iPad. I'm too busy with the TV. I'm too busy at the cinema. I'm too busy playing sport. I'm too busy, 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 busy. Fine. You shall remain a caterpillar for the rest of your days and die as a caterpillar. A hungry one. It's a book, isn't it? Right, next question. The very hungry caterpillar. Right, question number two. So now we've eaten and eaten and eaten... Now we get to the stage on the fifth time where I, can, I now build this cocoon around myself, which actually is my own skin. I've gone inside myself. That's what the caterpillar does. He's gone inside himself to melt down. Now, what I want you to think about this. This is your mind that now is, is, has gone into this cocoon state. What is that symbolic of? You've got Two minutes to look at 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18, Luke 5, verse 16, and Psalm 1, verse 2. Are you getting on? Everybody there? Anybody not there? <coughs> We're all there. So then, I'll read out a couple of these verses. This is what hopefully you've just read. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 6. Wherefore, come out... From among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. In uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we read, And Jesus withdrew himself into the wilderness, and he prayed. And, and there was the other verse as well in Psalm 1, verse 2. What, in your mind, is this cocoon-like state going into? Yeah. Meditation and It's meditation, isn't it? What else might it be? So we've got meditation, separation. separation. Yeah. Mr. Caterpillar can't see a great deal now, can he? Inside that cocoon that he's built around himself, he's no longer watching the TV. He's no longer, you know, booking his holiday. He now is locked down and he has cut off all distraction. The Lord Jesus Christ, it says, went into the wilderness to pray. Why did he go into the wilderness to pray? Why didn't he just pray where he was? He can concentrate. He can concentrate. Because even back then, even though there were no TVs and, and no technology and mobile phones going off, even then there was distraction. And he went into the wilderness to pray. He separated himself. He thought, I've read and thought a lot about God and what he wants me to do. And you know what? To get my head around this, I'm going to have to go somewhere quiet and separate myself, and turn everything off, switch everything down, and really think. And really, really, really think what I am doing. Do you think that's what he did? And do you know something? When he went into the wilderness, we're reading about what went on in his, in his own brain. He thought, you know, I could take over the world. I could commit suicide and throw myself off the temple. I could turn that stone into bread. They're all thoughts in his, in his mind. But he overcame it. But he did it in peace and quiet and on his own. And what I'm saying to you is this, that once you've read and read and read, you need to spend some time thinking, now what have I read? And switch the noise off. 
If your phone makes a ping when it takes, just get rid of that noise because it drives me yumpy at home and turn everything off and go quiet and think about what, you're, what, 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 what it is that you've read. Go into this cocoon thing. And more than that, it's not just a one-off thing. It's separate yourself away from the world. Separate yourself away from the world. Does that sort of make sense, this cocoon state of your mind? Does that add up? Therefore, come out from among them. Come, th- sorry, therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Come out from among them. You see, the thing is, if you were just there the whole time with all the noise of the world that was telling you this and telling you that and telling you it's too much, and your brain isn't focused on what God wants you to do, he says, separate yourselves. And there's the, uh, the caterpillar, separated, cut off, can't see anything other. This is your mind that's gone into this state. One other little thing I was going to mention to you, what the caterpillar does is actually fastens itself firm onto a branch. Right, it's like glue. He is glued on. Look at the end of his tail up there. That's what he's done. He's glued up there. And when and strong winds can blow, it won't it won't it won't sort of um, he won't come apart from the branch and uh, and and disappear. It's really really solid. And it makes me think that once we've eaten the word, what we're doing in Revelation 3 verse 3 is remember, it says, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Hold fast. So once you've read, the next stage is to hold fast to what you've learned and then go into this cocoon. Go into this sort of thought process. What am I reading? What am I doing? What is God telling me? Next question is this. Once the cocoon is built, the caterpillar goes into caterpillar soup. It completely deconstructs every single part of itself. Unlike the tadpole that grows from what it is, and you can watch it, The caterpillar does the opposite. It doesn't grow. It actually dissolves. Completely the opposite. And it's a soup. So this is now your brain. And you think to yourself, wait a minute. What's that talking about? I can understand being separated. But what is it for my mind to go into like a soup? That doesn't sound very logical. And then it's rebuilt again into a butterfly inside the cocoon. Here's what I think it is. Think about this. Once you've read the Bible and and you're meditating upon it, what you've got to do is deconstruct all the things that you think are true and rebuild them all again with the knowledge of God and what he says is true. And what you've now got just a few minutes to do is to think about these. I want you to think about three things that the world says is true But according to the Bible, they're not. And what this is doing is deconstructing what the world says is true. And then I want you to give me the answer as to what actually the truth is. Not everything that the world says is false. I'm not saying that at all. But I want you to think about three things that the world says this is true. Deconstruct it and say, well, actually, no, I don't think that is true because God says this is true. And that is the deconstructing of your mind and the rebuilding it in the image of what God says we should think. So you've got three minutes. You might need to talk to somebody about this. There's no verses to look up. I want you to think about three things that the world says are things that are true, but actually God says they're not. You've got three minutes to do that. Right. What things is the world saying that that they say is true, but actually is false. Give me some things. Yeah. Evolution. Yeah. evolution. Did anybody else have evolution in their mind? Yeah. yeah, so evolution. So the world says, and it's taught at the schools, that, e- that we have evolved from monkeys. Somehow or other, a monkey managed to get its brain working entirely different and has become like a human-type brain. Do you remember we said at the beginning that a monkey can't do what a human does, but something happened? Interesting, isn't it, that there isn't a single solitary Half monkey went wandering around. I know we look at some people and perhaps think that there are. But generally speaking, I'm not looking at you, Steve, when I say that. But basically, 
There are, where's all the millions of stages of monkey to man? And why have we still got the monkey? He stayed where he was, and the millions of stages come through to get to a man, and there are millions of stages according to their own literature, and yet not one of them survived. And all we're left with is the original monkey, and now a perfect man, and nothing in the middle. And despite all the excavations on everything, there's nothing found of all the billions of creatures that must have lived in the middle, nothing was found. Do you know something? You could put on that table there the, the evidence to do with all those missing links. And the pride of place for many years on that table was pilt down man. They said, here it is, we found it. And do you know something? It was a hoax. Somebody glued a monkey skull next to a human jaw and it was a hoax all along. And they put that in pride of place. So, what is the truth about that creation? So, God says, I made you as a human, and I made a monkey as a monkey, I made a caterpillar as a caterpillar. Nothing has changed species. Yes, you can have a tall man and a short man, but actually, no species will change into another species. And there's not a single solitary bit of evidence to say one species has ever changed into another species. And in Genesis 1, it clearly says that everything's got a seed in itself that will replicate its kind, its kind, its kind. It is basically telling you species will give birth to the same species. And that's all the evidence is on this planet. A, a, a fox, according to Sophie's evolutionary book at school, a, a, a horse a long time ago was a fox. And the fox evolved over all these years and became a horse. It's laughable. And yet, most of the world believe that that is true. Anything else in that the world says is true, but actually it's false. So there's lots of stuff on the religious side, isn't there, that we could, we could pick out lots of things that the world says you don't actually die when you die. Yes, Jack? Man's wisdom is paramount. Now, this is an interesting one, right? So this is about humanism. This is saying, because if we get rid of God, who's the top dog? Well, surely in the evolutionary scheme of things, it's us. So we should be able to solve anything and do anything. And, and, and if it's survival of the fittest, what is wrong with me killing somebody else if you're weaker and I'm stronger? I mean, wasn't that what Hitler said? That's where evolutionary thoughts and humanism ultimately take you. What's wrong with doing away with somebody who's weak? Because I'm fitter than you. What else is there out, out there right now that really totally goes against what God says. But politicians, and in fact only in this last week, a number of countries declared that this is right. What am I talking about? Sorry? Homosexuality. Homosexuality, from the world's point of view, is good, it's right. And for the first time in all human history, we've now got nations saying that two men can marry each other. In all human history, that has never, ever, ever happened. There's always been homosexuality. It's always been an abomination to God. God says it's wrong. And for the first time in millennia, people are now saying, actually, this, this, this can be a Christian, which is where marriage comes from, isn't it? It's God's uh, view. Marriage hasn't been invented by man. It comes from God. And now suddenly the world, instead of saying, well, I'm not a Christian, but I think I'm going to just go and do what I want to do, the abomination that's even worse now is that they're saying, well, this is, this is part of Christianity. We can actually have a marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. The world says that, that that's right. For, well, I don't know. There we are. And it says that in Romans 1 that you will get illnesses from this. So ultimately, it is absolutely, from the world's point of view, it's saying that it's right. God's view is that it's absolutely wrong. And so we could go on. The world says materialism is good, and money is good, and changing products every five minutes is what you need to do, and will advertise and make you think you need more and more. And actually, does it bring you anything, any extra degree of happiness? No. And so we could spend a long time... I've got a whole list of things here that the world says is true. And so what's happening in your brain is you're deconstructing the arguments of the world... Looking at them, thinking, well, they don't add up. What does add up? God's word adds up, and up you build. And now, what happens? Finally, 
we emerge from this cocoon state, having thought about what God think, wants us to think about, understanding the falseness of the world, and, and it's almost like, you know, we are set free. It's a bit, think of your mind now like this, because actually we're no longer on the ground as a caterpillar. Our minds are in the heavens. We're looking down using God's eyes and seeing things through God's eyes because we've used God's word of light to see these things for the truth of what they are. And we read in Isaiah 40 verse 31 that those who trust in the Lord will find new strength They will soar high on on wings like eagles. Now, it doesn't say butterflies, but you get the idea that if we're trusting in God, our minds will soar in the heavens and we will see the world for what it is. It's obvious, eh? It's breaking away from the world. It's becoming separate from the world. All of those things. Now, there's another interesting thing here. When the butterfly comes forth and starts flying... What does it go and do then? It reproduces itself. And what it does is produce another caterpillar. Well, many caterpillars. And so suddenly the cycle goes round again, doesn't it? So now we've got a caterpillar eating and eating and eating. Then it goes into a cocoon. Then it meditates. Then it comes out as a butterfly. Then it goes back to a caterpillar. And this is what we have to do. It isn't that I say, well, I I read the Bible last week and I had a good think about it and I've worked out a few bits and pieces and I'm about there now, so I'll just call that a day. If the butterfly didn't lay another egg, that butterfly is going to die and that would be the end of it. We have to keep reproducing and going through the cycle, the cycle, the cycle. So basically, we go back to being a hungry caterpillar. We go back to eating God's word. We go back to switching off the TV and meditating. We go back to reconstructing the arguments. We go back into the air, flying around. We go back to eating the word of God. We start meditating again, and round we go. That's why it says, be not conformed to this world... Don't listen to what the world's going on about because 90% of it is rubbish, but be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. If you renew something, what are you doing? Flourishing it. Yes. If you renew something, you're going back to the beginning and starting again and back to the beginning and off we go. It's not saying you get rid of all your knowledge, but you keep renewing your mind all the time. It's a process that you're going through. And what you're doing is proving what is good and acceptable to God. Does that make sense? And your knowledge is building up as time goes on. There's one other thing that the Mr. Butterfly is doing. He isn't just laying one egg. He's laying lots of eggs. There they all are, look. That's what they look like, little eggs. And what's that like, do you think? It's like more caterpillars spreading the word you see what happens is once we've got the knowledge and we become a butterfly only when I'm a butterfly can I make more caterpillars a caterpillar cannot make another caterpillar can it it's impossible if it didn't turn into a butterfly there would be no more caterpillars so once your brain has become a butterfly I can now produce more caterpillars and we were talking earlier on about the seminars how we who are believing have brought more people in to understand the truth. In effect, we've created more hungry caterpillars and they're eating and eating and eating. Some of them stop eating. They come for a few weeks and oh, I'm not, I don't like the taste of this leaf. I want chocolate cake. You're not giving me chocolate cake. This is a boring old leaf. I don't want it. Some keep eating and eating and eating and eating and turn into butterflies. And we've had four baptisms. I've nearly finished. Have I got five minutes? I always say yeah. I've got five minutes. Are you okay? Because if, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, five minutes. But this is the thing. This is the really exciting bit. You see, the thing is this. You might say, well, what's the point of me changing my mind? What's the point of going through metamorphosis of the brain? Still and dying like everybody else, and they've had a great time. And I've been sat there bored reading this dusty old book. Actually, that isn't true. The Bible, reading it now, will transform your life right now. 
It will keep you away from the diseases and the problems that people around you are having. But interestingly, what the deal is this, that one day Jesus is going to come back. And when Jesus comes back, it says there, we are eagerly waiting for Jesus to return as our saviour. And look what it says, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Now, guess what word that word changes there? It's not. It isn't. It isn't metamorphosis. I'm going to tell you what it is, and it is quite astounding what it is. And you might not have heard of this word before, because it's metaschematizo. In the Greek, there's a word metamorphosis, and there's another Greek word called metaschematizo. And that is that word there. Metas- he says our bodies are going to be not metamorphosized, but metaschematizoed. So the question then is, well, what does that mean? Metamorphosis in the Greek is all about inward change. That is exactly what metamorphosis in the original Greek was all about, inward change. Which is why it used the word in reference to your mind. Have a guess what metaschematizo might mean. Outward change. It's all about outward change. So in other words, if we've gone through the process of inward change, one day we'll go through the process of outward change. And here's another remarkable thing about these words. Metamorphosis is about utter and complete transformation, so it's unrecognizable. If I picked up a caterpillar and a butterfly and showed you the two without you knowing, you'd have no idea the two were related, would you? Not a clue. But Metaschematizo is outward change, but the thing is still recognizable. Now, when we are changed, when we are raised from the dead, or when Christ returns and we're made immortal, are we going to look completely and utterly different, like unrecognizable as a human being? Do you think? Are we still going to be recognizable as human beings? I think we are. When Jesus was raised from the dead, that yes, they didn't recognize him, but not because he had tentacles and a you know, and and wings or something, he looked like a human being. He was just a vastly improved human being. So it's a perfect word to describe when we are raised from the dead when Christ returns, or when he comes back and we're still alive, if we have gone through the process of metamorphosis of the mind, our bodies will be metaschematizoed. They will be changed outwardly, but still recognizable. I'm not going to walk up to Angie and say, well, uh, who are you then? Well, I was married to you, I think. Well, that's interesting. Of course it can't be right. We'll know each other and recognize each other. I haven't got many pictures of resurrection, because it doesn't often happen, does it? It's not very much on the news that somebody's been raised from the dead. But keep this image in your mind, if you would, please. If our minds have been metamorphosized... Our bodies will be metaschematizoed in the future. They will be changed into immortal bodies. We will be made immortal. We won't be made of flesh and blood. When Jesus gets back, you know, at the minute, if you stabbed me one, I would probably die fairly quickly, depending on where you did it, and I would bleed and die. Do you know something in the kingdom? Our bodies will be transformed into something that is not flesh and blood as we're made of now. Nobody will be able to kill you. In fact, you'll never, ever die. You'll live forever. And really, the whole picture of the caterpillar caterpillar into the butterfly could also be seen in that context as well, that we start off on the earth as a grubby little thing, and ultimately we become something different and flying. And we will one day be raised from the dead and made immortal beings. But here's the thing. If you don't go through the inward change now... You'll never get this bit in the future. God cares about one thing and one thing only. It's not how fast you can run. It's not how far you can swim. It's not the tallest mountain you can climb. It's not even how brilliant your brain is. It's purely and simply, have you listened to what he has said? Have you followed his commands? Have you tried to work it out? And if you just do that thing and follow him, this bit will happen. 
I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all stay dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And that is why the, your mind and your brain is the most wonderful thing that you've got that sets you above everything else. And if you're pumping it full of videos and this, that and all the other, and none of it's through with the word of God, you will remain a caterpillar and you will die game over. If you can get it to change into a butterfly, it will change your mind now. It will change your life now for the better, I guarantee you, both now and in the future when Jesus gets back.